A very good afternoon to everyone. This is Soumya from Manopatra, and I extend a warm welcome to all our attendees. Um, thank you again for joining us for this webinar on GDPR: Making Sense of the Local EU Law with Global Implications. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, Ms. Kalpana Muthiredi. Ms. Muthiredi is a business lawyer with licenses and experience working in India and the US. She has worked with emerging cut and cutting edge technologies, including cloud computing agreements, biotechnology, and other IT space enterprises. She has extensive in-house and law firm experience working with fortune companies and market leaders. I'm sure all our attendees will derive much value from her experience through this lecture today. Now, before we begin, um, before I request Ms. Muthiredi to start, a little brief housekeeping. We received a considerable number of questions regarding the topic during the webinar registrations and have tried to incorporate them throughout the webinar. Uh, if you have any more questions, you can share with us in the Q&A box and we'll take them up at the end of the session. So without any further ado, I'll request Ms. Muthiredi to share with us her insights on the topic. Ma'am, come on mute. I'm sorry. Can you all hear me now? Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Kalpana. And uh, today I'll be sharing with you a few fundamentals of the General Data Protection Regulation, also known as the GDPR. So today we will uh, start with a quick overview of what we're going to discuss. And that would be um, starting with the introduction, applicability, why we have GDPR in the first place, and um, what are the key principles of the GDPR itself. So um, we will go with uh, the scope, uh, who it is applicable to, who the key players are, the key concepts, um, key terms that you come across uh, in the course of this regulation. What are the major legal basis for processing personal data under this regulation? And um, what are the data subject rights that a data subject would be able to exercise? Then we move on to the, uh, the um, compliance measures, which I will again go a little in depth just so that you understand what this regulation means to you from uh, an organization perspective. And then eventually what happens when we don't uh, comply with the regulation or if there's a breach incident, uh, the penalties that you might be facing. So that would be as far as the GDPR itself is concerned. Um, and I will end it up with a quick overview of the Indian counterpart of this regulation, the PDP bill. So overall, this is what you will be um, taking away from this webinar and I hope you will find it useful eventually. Thank you. So uh, before we start, I'll just launch a quick poll. And uh, I request all the attendees to please record your responses here. Okay, so with this insight now, um, I'll request ma'am to take over and start just in a second. Thank you, Sonia. Just a second. Yeah. You can start now. Thank you, Sonia. So uh, we'll start with the beginning uh, as to what the GDPR is all about and uh, why we uh, need the GDPR in the first place. Well, uh, the GDPR, as we know, is the most comprehensive and the latest regulation on protection of data privacy and personal data of individuals in the European Union. Uh, effective uh, May 25th, 2018, 
uh, it has repealed the 1995 EU directive on data protection and uh, has become the talking point because of its ramifications on businesses worldwide and of course the penalties. So we need to understand uh, what is the scope and the extent of the application of the GDPR just to see where we stand uh, in relation to this regulation. Uh, this uh, regulation applies to processing the data of individuals who are physically in the European Union. It is not limited to EU citizenship or residence or other legal status. If they are in the EU, they have the protection. If they are not in the EU, they do not have the protection. So if your organization processes personal data belonging to individuals in the European Union, either directly or indirectly, or if your organization is established in the EU and happens to process personal data of individuals, then yes, you're subject to the GDPR. Now, Coming to what becomes a subject matter of the GDPR, it's personal data. And um, the regulation defines personal data and has two types of personal data that would be um, slightly different in the way they are handled. So one is personal data and two is sensitive personal data or what they call special categories of personal data. Personal data is information that belongs to an individual a living a natural human being. So we don't have entities or legal um, entities which may have a legal presence, but they would not be considered uh, data subjects or individuals for the purposes of this regulation. It's an actual living human being. So a person who is no longer alive will not have data protection as regards their data under this regulation. So that's one distinction. So what kind of data belonging to an individual would be considered personal data? Anything that can be used to identify them. It's what we call the unique identifiers, such as the name, their uh, address, uh, the date of birth, their phone number, the IP address, uh, the location, uh, social media profiles, uh, any, any of these identifiers that are specific to their physical, their physiological, genetic, mental, economic, cultural, or social identity of this individual. And of course, uh, any data relating to this, which would be considered personal data, can be processed under the GDPR. Then we come to what's personal data in that case. Now, this is something that is uh, extremely sensitive and is much more specific to the individual, such as their um, racial origin, ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, things like trade union memberships or um, the specific genetic data, their biometric data, fingerprints, um, any other data such as the health uh, information or their sexual orientation or any other uh, information that could be considered uh, extremely sensitive and uh, could have a larger implication when it concerns this individual. And that should be handled with extra care and security, and the GDPR prohibits processing of this data, but of course it per permits it subject to certain exceptions. So that's as far as personal data is concerned and the categories under this regulation. Next we come to how is the GDPR different from its predecessor? Well, before we understand how it is different from the EU uh, directive of 1995, or we need to understand why the GDPR replaced the directive in the first place. The directive dealt with data protection and so does the GDPR. So why do we need a fresh new regulation in this regard? Firstly, uh, the EU directive was relevant in and sufficient for the 1990s. But between then and now, we have seen how technology has become much more complex. Business transactions have become a lot more sophisticated and the online presence of the average individual has increased multifold be it the social media presence, financial transactions, or accessing medical help, shopping, you name it, and people are spending a lot more time online and leaving behind a huge digital footprint. This has exposed them to a huge risk and potential for misuse of their personal data. So then we, there, there are quite a few things that are different from the uh, regulation and the directive. The GDPR has kind of moved away from the directive, which was more like a baseline uh, law 
for uh, data protection. So what it has done is it has um, built on the key tenets of the data protection directive and has built in a few more specific requirements, such as, for instance, it has expanded the definition and scope of the term personal data to include a person's online and digital data, such as email, uh, email address, their phone IP, uh, phone's IMEI numbers, their uh, uh, computer's IP address, and social media profiles, so any information online or any information that can be shared online which could be used to identify an individual. Secondly, this regulation has streamlined the uh, process for organizations doing business in the European Union. Before the GDPR came into existence, uh, the directive was more of a directive. It was more like a guideline which told these different entities, there were at that time about 28 or 30 member states. And the EU directive was simply a guideline telling them you can, have your own laws on data protection that were just as stringent as the guidelines, but you are free to have your own laws. So the result of this was there were about 30 different laws and 30 different legal regimes where data protection was concerned. And any entity that had to do business in the European Union with let's say maybe three, four, five countries had to deal with three, four, or five different legal regimes and their own set of specific requirements which made it a lot difficult for organizations doing business in the European Union. The GDPR has done away with all that. Now we now have one regulation. We know what we need to do and how to go about doing it, regardless of which European member state you're doing business in. You could be doing business in one company, uh, you know, with one company in the European Union or 10 different companies with presences in 10 different countries, and you could still be doing very well if you're compliant with the GDPR. So that's one great advantage. The second thing is, um, or rather the third thing, was um, a very striking feature of the GDPR is the very short deadlines for notification of breach, specific and defined procedures to follow in the event of a breach. Uh, you have to notify the data protection authority within 72 hours of becoming aware of a breach and uh, give them the details of the nature and extent of the breach, what damage mitigation action you have taken to prevent further uh, a risk to the individual and what salvage operations you have put in place. You also had to uh, ensure that if the breach posed a high risk to the freedom and rights of the data subject, that is the individual whose data has been at risk uh, or has been compromised, you have to also inform the data subject that their data has been compromised. So, and the final and the fourth uh, area where the GDPR has come in very strongly is the stringent compliance requirements throughout and of course the higher penalties. These then were, uh, are the different, um, I would say, uh, areas and very prominent uh, differences between the GDPR and the EU directive. So that's as far as the um, differences between the GDPR and the directive are concerned. And then we move on next to the main elements of the GDPR. So for the purposes of this discussion, we will look at uh, a few, few of the um, essentials of the regulation, which they may not be comprehensive, but they bring together the meat of the regulation, as I call it. So if you're aware of these principles, you will be able to navigate the entire regulation. You will know what you know, and you will know what you don't know, because now you have a few uh, a few good ideas as to what this regulation is all about, what it expects from you, and how to go about complying with it. So we start with the key principles, the foundation of why we have this uh, regulation in place, and the key players, who are the main uh, entities and uh, individuals that you might come across in the course of this regulation, and the legal basis, the um, legal reasons and the legal uh, requirements for you to fulfill before you're able to process the data, as, as the regulation calls it, the legal basis for processing data. Then we have the core concepts, uh, which you will come across time and again in the course of this regulation, and it helps to understand what they are, so that next time you come across these terms, you will know what the uh, regulation is talking about. 
And then of course the data subject rights. The GDPR is very specific about the rights of the individual. Uh, the data subject simply is an individual whose uh, personal data is being processed under this regulation. And as we just discussed, it is an individual who is in the European Union at the time of sharing the personal data. So this, this is what we would discuss uh, as far as the main elements of the GDPR are concerned. And I will start with the key principles. We have uh, six key principles and the regulation calls for accountability in handling personal data. And uh, accountability essentially consists of following these six principles. Firstly, we have lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. Uh, lawfulness, fairness simply means when you're collecting data for the purposes of whatever business that you are in, you have to be, uh, you, you must ensure that that's a lawful business. The purpose you're collecting for is a lawful purpose. It's, uh, it's done, the, the collection of data is done in a fair and transparent manner. And you inform the data subject why and how the data will be used. So you have to have some level of transparency in how you're uh, getting the data from the data subject. Then you go on to purpose limitation. What is that? It simply means that the data you collect must be used only for the purpose for which it was specified and collected. Then comes data minimization. You collect only data that is relevant and adequate to the purpose. And storage limitation likewise means you store the data only as long as required and only to the extent required. You can't store it all over the place. Make sure it's, uh, it's kept on a um, as needed basis only accessed by people who need to access it and stored only for as long as you need it. And of course, any data that you, can, uh, you collect has to be accurate. And uh, if you're keeping it for a longer period of time, make sure it's updated periodically. Integrity and confidentiality, of course, we've already discussed, deals uh, ensures confidentiality of the data is always paramount and data is handled with due care and diligence at all times and under all circumstances. That's as far as the key principles are concerned. Now we come to the key players. So these are some of the individuals you come across time and again, and uh, uh, these are, uh, uh, they, they have their own rights and responsibilities, and it would help to understand a little about who these uh, individuals are. We've already discussed who a data subject is and they do have some rights under this uh, regulation. The controller is one who is the person or entity or an organization that determines the purposes and means of the processing of the personal data of the individual. Then comes the data processor. The data processor is one who processes personal information on behalf of and under the instructions of the data controller. So between the controller and the processor, the main difference is, is the controller who determines how the data is going to be used, how it's going to be processed, and uh, what eventually happens to the data. So both of them have obligations, but then the obligations of the controller are a tad higher when it comes to the regulation. Then of course the data subject, as we just discussed, is a natural individual and it's somebody who is present and living in the European Union at the time of sharing the personal data. Then we have something called the data protection authority. A data protection authority is also known sometimes as a supervisory authority. They are interchangeable terms. So sometimes you could see something called a supervisory authority. It's very much the DPA here. This is an independent authority. It's a public authority that is established by a member state. So every single member state, at the moment we have about, I think 27 member states in the European Union. So you have 27 DPAs. So every single member state, every single country has one DPA, which is a supreme authority in that country as far as um, regulating the GDPR compliance is concerned. They are primarily responsible for monitoring and ensuring GDPR compliance and to facilitate free flow of personal data within 
the European Union. Then comes the data protection officer. This is somebody who is a leadership role and is in charge of ensuring compliance with the GDPR. So they're responsible for overseeing the company's data protection strategy and implementation. It's somebody you have in-house. It's not mandatory to appoint a DPO uh, in in-house unless one of three circumstances exist. Firstly, your organization is a public authority. Secondly, you, you, do, you do large scale processing of personal data. Let's say you're a nursing home, for instance. There's a large scale um, amount of personal data of individuals floating day in and day out. So you should have a DPA in-house in such a case. Thirdly, there's a mandate from a particular EU member state requiring you to have a DPA, DPO in-house. So in that case, you have to have a specific officer housed inside your organization uh, as a data protection officer. If none of these three conditions exist, then of course you're free to just have a key member of your team uh, or a key employee who can take care of, of GDPR compliance requirements within the uh, organization. But then regardless of who is overseeing your GDPR, whether you have somebody specifically named as a DPO or not, the regulatory requirements must be met and any violation will put you in breach and, in, and at risk of potential penalties. We now come to the legal basis for processing personal data. As I mentioned a little while ago, there are six legal bases or six legal uh, conditions under which you can process personal data. One is contractual necessity. Where an organization is processing personal data under a legal contractual obligation with another organization, then they're well within their rights to process data. Secondly is compliance with a legal obligation that is legal obligations that occur under the European Union, under the European Union law, that is specific only to EU member states. So if you're not in the EU, well, you can't really use this legal basis. It's for someone exclusively within the EU Union. Then comes protecting vital interest. Your data is private, unless you're doing harm to yourself or others, in which case it may be subject to processing. So. This is one of those uh, situations where somebody can override your right as a data subject and use your data to protect you. Let's say you're committing, trying to commit suicide and somebody wants to know who you are. Probably they could just go ahead and try to uh, share your information and that would not be violating the GDPR. Then comes a legitimate interest. This is as important as vital interest and this would be a compelling reason for businesses that work with one another and have to transfer data between each other. Next, we come to public interest. These are compelling grounds that override the freedoms of a data subject. For instance, in the case of a pandemic, such as the one we are in right now, the let us say the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, may gather data about the pandemic, where it started, how it may be communicated, who the carriers might be, and other such type of data gathering activities which are necessary to ensure that the situation is controlled, this will definitely outweigh the freedom of the individual data subjects in the interest of general public. And that is a good enough reason for um, an entity to process personal data of individuals. Finally, we come to consent. Consent is perhaps the largest point of discussion in the GDPR and also has some ambiguity concerning how it is to be obtained and whether consent uh, is just the only way for anyone to be able to process data under this regulation. I will discuss consent a little more in detail when we come to the discussion on core concepts because I think it merits a little more detailed um, discussion and hopefully eliminate some confusion about need for consent in order to process data. So these are about the six uh, basis for processing personal data. Beyond these six, there is no other uh, valid 
uh, opportunity for any entity to process personal data under the GDPR. Next, we come to key concepts. Before we move up key concepts, can we have that poll, ma'am, here? Yeah, sure. Please go ahead, Sonia. Yeah. So I hope uh, all our attendees are having a great session so far. Uh, before we move forward, I'll just post a poll here and kindly record your responses. Okay, so these were the results from the poll. And ma'am, if you would like to take this a little and then move forward. Yes, Samya, thank you. So uh, we see that, you know, most people think, uh, you know, yes, it's not the only legal basis, but a good number also think that's the only basis to lawfully process personal data. But as we've just seen, we have five other uh, legal bases under which somebody can validly and lawfully process personal data. You can move ahead with the presentation now. Thank you. So moving on to the core concepts here, we have um, processing. Processing uh, is, um, we already discussed what personal data is, so I will not go back into that. Uh, we have, um, we've already discussed um, a little bit of what processing is, but I want to explain a little more in detail as to what the term processing actually entails. Processing is any operation or set of operations involving personal data and includes collecting, holding, transferring, or erasure of data. Holding means, and, and it could include a lot of activities such as collection, recording, organizing, structuring, storage, and could also mean adaptation or retrieval, consultation, or using the data in any way, or disclosure by transmission, or dissemination or otherwise making available in terms of um, either sharing it individually or by combining it or linking it with other bits of data. So as you can see, the definition or the meaning of the term processing is pretty all encompassing. It is done intentionally with the intention to include all possible attempts to handle the data. Right from the moment you collect the data uh, to having it with you and transferring. And even if you were to simply get the data and erase it, that would be considered processing under this uh, regulation. And uh, of course, the processors and controllers must follow certain requirements when processing personal data. Then we come to consent. Now we now know that consent is one of the six legal bases for processing personal data. And uh, to be valid, consent must be freely given, has to be specific. And it should be an informed consent given in an unambiguous form. What it simply means is when you're asking a data subject for consent, they need to make sure that they understand what they are asking for. They, the data subject must know that uh, their uh, information is uh, going to be used by somebody for certain purposes. And that's a uh, free voluntarily given information or consent. Now, parental consent will be required in order to process the personal data of children under the age of 16 or in some member states as low as 13 years old. Parental consent will be allowed for children and the controller should be able to demonstrate that the data subject has voluntarily provided this consent to such processing. It could be minors or majors, but there has to be a voluntary uh, consent to sharing of data. And consent should be a clear affirmative action. Now, this is where the GDPR is very particular Consent should be, when they say it has to be clear and affirmative, it means uh, deliberate and specific action to opt in to share the information. 
it could be either in writing or it could, could be by electronic means or as, as a verbal statement, but it should not be a presumed consent. So you have to switch out from an opt-out method to an opt-in method of collecting data where the data subject must give explicit permission to use their personal data. Uh, so rather than assuming user consent by, you know, by assuming their silence as an acquisience, they have to explicitly stand up and say, yes, this is my consent. I'm allowing you to use this information. So that's as far as um, explicit in consent is concerned. And this approach applies to everything, even if you're just adding a customer's email ID to your list, to your email newsletter list. Then users, you don't just don't have to decide whether they collect and use data. They can also determine how you use the data. So that again comes as part of the data subject rights, which I will discuss a little later on. But you just need to know that consent is extremely crucial, and um, a user might opt to opt out entirely at any point by exercising their right to be forgotten. In which case, it becomes your responsibility to scrub their data from your systems. Now that's the issue with consent. The data subject has a right to withdraw consent at any time and once that happens, the processor must stop processing the data regardless of where they are with their business. This could impact the activities of the processor adversely, but this is one of the reasons why I would advise choosing consent as the last resort option after they've exhausted the other five bases for processing and made applicable. So uh, that's as far as consent is concerned. And then we uh, come across certain other concepts time and again in the course of this regulation, and that is privacy by design by default, data mapping, DPIA. Uh, DPIA stands for Data Process Impact Assessment. And these are three concepts uh, which uh, I will discuss um, when we come to the um, area discussing uh, compliance requirements, because these form part of the compliance requirements of a processor or a controller. So before we get to the compliance requirements, I want to put in a quick note about data subject rights, just so that we know what kind of data subject rights uh, an individual can assert. Somia, if you have any questions on this so far, uh, would you like to share them? Sure, ma'am. So uh, there are a lot of questions that are coming in. We'll take like a few of them right now and a few after. So one of the questions that had come in, like as we explain GDPR right now. So could you please provide some clarity on GDPR from an HR perspective? So how sure. are you supposed to do? Sure. See, HR is just one of an internal business operations and chances are that you could be processing data of your employees world over, including the European Union, and then uh, treat that just as any other personal data under the regulation. So there is uh, no difference between data being shared um, as an outsider uh, and data shared uh, you know, from within the organization. You're all subject to the same requirements as long as that data belongs to somebody in the European Union. So uh, we are talking, again, information such as personal data, names, date of birth. And uh, one, one uh, pointer I'd like to give here is uh, very often there is a doubt as to whether, uh, you know, name any people, a lot of people have names, especially in companies. And a lot of people may have a common name. Sometimes they might have a common last name. So how do you identify them? Can that alone become a unique identifier? Well, you see, the thing with personal data is, Sometimes, you know, things like names, you may have common names and that when you're combining with yet another element, such as let's say the designation, then it becomes a unique identifier. That does not in any way mean that the name is not part of personal data. What it means is when there are two or more such elements, which by themselves may mean nothing, let's say for instance, um, um, you know, something like a senior software engineer, a designation by itself means nothing, but when it's combined with a certain name, then you understand and the name of an organization, then you know you're identifying an individual. So, you know, these are just, just I'm going a little off tangent to clarify this doubt that comes up time and again, where they say, oh, how are these individual pieces, personal data? The, the very fact that by combining it with other bits of information, they can help identify an individual 
makes them uh, personal data. And yes, when you're dealing with uh, details like that, especially in HR, you would be very um, you know, careful in handling them, designations, identifiers, other genetic identifiers, especially health, uh, health, health matters and things like that. You may collect a lot of information and you will have to deal with it as you would deal with any personal data at the end of the day and comply with all relevant requirements. Um, thank you, ma'am. Just one more question, if we could take here. Yeah. So, uh, like, could you please elaborate a little on what exactly what data needs to be protected under GG, uh, GDPR, and like, do we need an agreement to protect our interests and ensure compliance with the data protection? Actually, see, this is law. Uh, it's, it's a regulation. It's mandated. So you don't really need an agreement to further assert a right under law. So we don't really need an agreement. Uh, secondly. Uh, as we discussed, personal data. And we also discussed different categories which would be considered personal data and which would come within the purview of the GDPR. Yeah, sure, ma'am. Um, should we take it forward or should we take like a couple more questions? Uh, what we will do is uh, let's cover a little more of this. Uh, we have a few more important topics to cover. And then depending on how much time we have, we will just go ahead and uh, share the rest of the questions. Okay, sure. Thank you. So moving on next to the core, uh, we are done with the core concepts for now. I will discuss the rest of them when we discuss uh, compliance measures. So coming to the data subject rights, there are quite a few data subject rights that um, have been, again, um, you know, a talk talking point and subject of discussion. I will discuss three of them a little more in depth, uh, and I will just bring a reference to the remaining five. We have eight data subjects granted to the individuals. Um, the first of them is the right to be informed. The right to be informed simply means that the individuals need to know who is collecting their data and how their data is being used. So you as the controller or the processor must provide the data subject with information, including your purposes for processing the data, your retention period, uh, and who, who you will share this data with. So it has to be, again, in a precise, transparent, comprehensible and easily accessible form, which means you just can't hide that you know, information in a mass of information, page 50 of you know, 200 page document. It has to be clear and upfront. It should be easily comprehended. And this information can be in writing or in an electronic form, or you could also use certain standardized image symbols, uh, which are universally accepted if uh, you no know, language is an issue. Uh, but it has to be used in such a way that you are able to convey a meaningful overview of the message, which simply says, we are processing your information. And they should be able to understand it clearly without any ambiguity. That's what is the right to be informed all about. Then we have the right of access by the data subjects. The right of access includes information about the processing activities or the processing purposes. Um, it's referred to as subject access sometimes, and it gives individuals the right to obtain a copy of their personal data, as well as other supplementary information relating to how their data is being used. It helps them to understand how and why uh, your data is being used and to check if you know, the data is being done uh, or rather if the processing is being done um, properly. That's as far as the right of access is concerned. And there's not much there except that um, when a data subject asserts the right to access and asks for information about that, the um, entity must comply with it. And unless there is an extremely rare situation, uh, they have no right to refuse uh, to comply with the data subject request. Then we come to the right of erasure that is also known as the right of right to be forgotten. So the GDPR has introduced this right for individuals uh, where they can make a request and that request can be um, either in writing or a verbal request asking that their details be completely removed from the internet all over the net, uh, wherever uh, this particular uh, data has been shared. So once a request is made, the controller must immediately uh, seize further uh, processing of that data and also erase all the data from their records. Um, if the data subject has withdrawn their consent or other, otherwise subjects objects to the processing um, and the data controller continues to use that data, then the controller would be in direct violation of the GDPR. 
Now, this right becomes very relevant, especially when you are talking of somebody who has given their consent as a minor or, or whose consent was given through somebody else when they were minors and now they are majors and they want to withdraw consent. Or let's say somebody was on Facebook when, when they joined, when they were 15 or, you know, 15 or 16 years old, and now they want to withdraw all information. Uh, they can go ahead and uh, remove all their personal data from the internet or the records of the controller. The data subject should be able to exercise this right even though they are no longer minors. And that's an important distinction here. There are some exceptions uh, where uh, retention of personal data is necessary under law and um, to exercise the right of freedom and uh, expression and information of a compliance with laws. Or let us say, you know, in defense of legal claims, those are exceptions, but they would of course be treated on a case by case basis. So these are some of the you know, main rights that have been uh, you know, a matter of debate and uh, discussion for a while. And there are also some of the other rights such as the right to restrict processing. So this uh, is a right where a data subject can object to any data of theirs being processed. But this is a right that is applicable only under two conditions, that is, Firstly, when the processing is based on a legitimate interest or when the processing is based on a public interest. So only when there are two, these two of the six legal bases for processing data are, are present, can this data subject exercise their right to restrict processing. For example, objecting for direct marketing purposes. Then comes the right of data portability. That's something we're all used to, you know, the right to allow individuals to obtain and reuse their personal data for their own purposes across different services. For example, you know, porting our numbers from a mo one mobile service provider to another. Then comes the right to object, which is simply the right to you know, object to any processing of personal data at any time. This effectively means you have to stop uh, any processing of the data. Then comes the right of the data subject to object to any decision that is based solely and simply on, a, on an automatic or an automated processing. So this simply means that um, there's a lot of profiling that happens when there's automatic, automated processing happening. So a data subject or an individual can say, I will not be subject to any decision that comes about as a result of such automatic processing, such as, you know, like I just mentioned, there's some profiling that's happening based on certain data that's being processed elsewhere. And this could process, I mean, this could lead to legal effects, which could affect uh, the individual or could have some very significant um, impact on them. And that's the reason why uh, this particular right also has been uh, granted uh, under the uh, GDPR. So these are as far as the eight data subject rights are concerned. And uh, next we move on to the compliance requirements. This is what I would call the meat of the um, regulation because uh, a lot of it um, is about uh, you know, what needs to be done, how, when, and what happens if we don't. So um, I will try to quickly give you an overview of what compliance requirements are required, but I'll try to keep it short, but add in as much information as possible so that tomorrow when you look at certain terms or certain concepts that deal with compliance, uh, you would understand uh, what they mean and uh, know how to go about um, following those requirements. So from my observation, compliance is essentially, or it's a two pronged thing. You have firstly technical measures, and then there are what you call organizational best practices. Technical measures are things like um, encryption, um, anonymization of data or uh, pseudonymization of data. You, you masking the data. And then there are things like uh, privacy by design by default. Then there's also called something called DPIA. So what are all these things and uh, trans, uh, transparency requirements when you're uh, dealing with information, when you're collecting information, there need to be certain transparency requirements that have to be met. So what is what are all these things? I'll quickly run you through some of them, uh, starting with um, encryption. So Encryption, pseudonymization are all just methods of uh, masking data or making it uh, 
unintelligible to the person who is not supposed to access the data. So as we know, under this requirement, we have to uh, store data in either an encrypted form or a pseudonymized form in order to prevent misuse. These are just two technical you know, uh, means of ensuring data is uh, in encrypted. And um, pseudonymization is a technique to replace one or more attributes of personal data to make identification of a natural person difficult. It is a reversible process and using a software handle, you can reverse it and make sure that you're able to access the personal data once again. But it helps to mask data to make misuse of data difficult. And even if someone does get access to the data, uh, they will not be able to make sense of it. But because it can revert to its original uh, form, it is considered personal data and is subject to the GDPR. So also encryption, which is uh, where data, data is jumbled and encrypted to make access to personal data difficult. It's also reversible. And again, because it can be decrypted, it's also subject to the GDPR. Then talking of anonymization. Now that's a technique similar to pseudonymization. But here, what we do is we replace one or more attributes of the personal data to make identification impossible. There is no way you can identify who that person is. It's an irreversible process. You can't reverse it. And um, once you have anonymized data, there is no way you can go back and revert to the original personal data, nor can you identify any personal data of any individual once the data is anonymized. So because it's irreversible, this data falls outside the purview of the GDPR. And if, if you're dealing with anonymized data, you don't have to worry about GDPR requirements. Next comes privacy by de design and default. Now, a quick note on privacy by design is very simply what it means is once a product or service has been released to the public, the strictest privacy settings should apply by default without any manual or actual input by the user, the end user. It simply means data protection measures have to be inbuilt into the product or the activities or the business practices right at the design stage. And they should go right through the life cycle of the product or the service until the end of that product or service. So for example, um, we know mobile phones have screen lock facility. When mobile phones came into the market all those years ago, they had no facility. Anybody accessing a phone could look at all information on the phone. But over time, we developed uh, we developed things like uh, uh, you know, screen locks with number, numbers, passwords, pattern passwords, and things like that. Today, they're a lot more sophisticated with fingerprint access and uh, things like that. But this is, again, a, a classic example of how privacy by design has gotten more sophisticated with time. So that's something uh, which uh, GDPR has made mandatory. Privacy by design was present as one of the requirements under privacy laws earlier, but it was not mandatory. But today, GDPR makes it mandatory for anyone putting out a product or service into the market. Then moving on to um, data transfer to third countries. I will come to data mapping later. Uh, I'll move to data transfer because um, that has a little to do with, uh, again, certain um, technical measures that have to be taken before uh, someone has to transfer the data to a third country outside the European Union. Now, data transfer is not prohibited under, G under the regulation, but it is subject to certain requirements. It's uh, basically a two-step process where uh, firstly, the intended data transfer must meet the general requirement of transfer. The transfer itself must be legal and further authorization is required before the data transfer uh, can be done. And once that data transfer requirement is met, such as let's say the fulfilling a contract or protecting vital interests, uh, they have uh, met with the threshold requirement of being able to transfer the data. The second thing is, well, is a country to which they're transferring data, is it something that has adequate uh, data protection measures already in place? It is what we call uh, adequacy requirement. It simply means that the, if the EU commission, the, the European Union commission finds that this is a country which has pretty, pretty good data protection laws, then yes, data transfer is possible. And uh, just so that we know, some of the Scandinavian countries have pretty good data protection laws and they're considered adequate, but uh, countries outside that, uh, most of the countries outside the EU 
don't really have data protection uh, laws that are considered adequate. And so there has to be uh, some bit of uh, uh, protection measures that have to be taken before um, the transfer is done. So that would be what we call um, the obligation of the controller to ensure and show that adequate data protection is provided to the data that's being transferred. And this can be done through you know, one of several methods. Uh, one of them would be something called uh, binding corporate rules, where they show that we are following certain specific rules, or maybe a certificate of data and you know, data protection and things like that. So this is generally how they handle uh, the requirements uh, when it comes to transferring data to a third country outside the EU. Next, we come to um, data mapping, which is actually a, you know, an organizational best practice. Uh, this is um, largely, a very, uh, it's, it's what I would call an in-house practice where you're, it's a system of cataloging what data you've collected so far, how it's used, where it is stored, how it travels throughout your organization and outside. So there are various ways to achieve this. Uh, you can keep it as simple as possible or make it as complicated as you want. A lot depends on your own organization, the processing activities you conduct using the data. And um, it requires you know, certain information before you can actually do a full-fledged data mapping. So some of the um, information you would need is things like what data you collected, or whether that data is sensitive personal data, or does it contain sensitive personal data? And what, are, what is the legal basis for processing the data? One of the six bases we discussed earlier. Why this data is being collected? How long you want to store it? What conditions you're storing it under? Uh, what protective measures you have in place? And whether the data is being transferred, where it is being transferred, and who the third party recipients are, where they are located, if they're international, and what protocols are in place to protect data during transfers. So these are the things that would consist of you know, a full-fledged data mapping exercise. That's again, one of the best organizational best practices I've seen works very well because it, it goes right there along with your uh, log books, keeping a log book, holding data in a safe and secure location. And in the event of a breach or an incident, this will really help you to identify where you have data, what data has been breached and what to do next to secure the data that you have with you. Then of course, we come to something called uh, data processing impact assessment. A data processing impact assessment simply is a process that will help, help you to identify and minimize uh, whatever risks your data processing activity could lead to. Now, for instance, um, sometimes when using specific technologies uh, while you're processing data, uh, there may be a likelihood that that processing could lead to a high risk to the rights and freedoms, or essentially the data of the individual. It could expose them to some level of risk. And that may not be um, uh, quite good for anyone concerned. So in such a case, what you could do is carry out an assessment of the impact of that envisaged processing. Uh, you could do this one of two ways. You could either identify every specific processing activity that you could do and conduct um, processing impact assessment you're simply trying to see what impact my processing activity has on this particular data. That is what DPIA is all about. So you could either do it based on a specific processing activity, or you could um, address a set of similar processing activities that have similar risks and then conduct uh, a data process impact assessment to identify how it could impact the data subject. But again, you have to seek the advice of the data protection officer uh, who will then communicate that to the DPA if there's any risk. And depending on the risk involved and the processing activity itself, um, they will advise you on the next course of action. But largely this comes up when you're discussing new technologies such as artificial intelligence or machine learning, blockchain. So uh, there are a lot of, um, of variables there and a lot of uh, unknowns and that could impact how your data could be affected. And a DPIA is an ex excellent tool to take care of those concerns. Then of course, we have transparency through privacy mode, which is not mentioned there, but again, that's one of the uh, uh, very important uh, means of ensuring transparency. All it simply means is there's a privacy notice or a privacy statement that tells the data subject what we're doing with their data. 
tell them how we're going to use the data, uh, what we will be doing with it, and eventually how long we will store it with us. Uh, again, they should be sufficiently informed to ensure a fair and transparent processing. Uh, and the privacy notice is something we see very often when we come upon uh, open a website and you have a privacy notice or a statement. You have to do the same thing with employees. And Soumya, you had a question about um, HR doing it. Uh, how, how do they deal with uh, personal data? One of the means is, let's say you, you're act doing something that has some impact or you're conducting some activities that have some impact on data subjects of your employees. So again, um, you have something called an intranet privacy notice, which you have to just share within the organization, let them know what's happening with their data and how it's going to impact them. So this works both ways, within the organization as well as with the outer world. Eventually, uh, it all comes down to how good your organizational best practices are. You have things like, yes, uh, DPIA, data mapping, and inventory. Make sure you have a good inventory of whatever processing activities you have done so that there is, um, you have a good idea what is where and how it's being handled. Who has access to the, the data, how they access it, and um, generally uh, a larger control of whatever data you have with you. Then there's company-wide awareness sensitization to personal data. Make sure you have it uh, uh, through the rank and file of the organization. You hold the data in a safe and secure location. Keep a logbook of activities involving all the processing. And in case of a breach, make sure that appropriate notification is sent. Adequate breach response has to be taken. And as soon as the breach is detected, it's important for both the controllers and processors to notify the DPO and if required, the DPA, that is the supervisory authority, the data protection authority, take immediate remedial action to ensure that the impact is limited or contained and that no further unintended access to information is, continu is continued. For instance, let's say your website is hacked, make sure you bring down the website first of all and then do any salvage operations that need to be done. That's as far as uh, compliance requirements are concerned. Any questions so far, Soumya, from with regards to compliance? Yes, ma'am, there are questions also, like we are running a little short on time. So I'll just take up a few. Yeah we can do here. So one that is coming up again and again is how do we become 100% compliant with the GDPR? So like if you could address that. Sure. Uh, well, uh, you know, GDPR, like, like any other regulation or compliance requirement is um, not a one-off effort. It's an ongoing process. And uh, you don't really, um, say with certainty, okay, I've done so much now, I got this certificate or a license and yes, I'm good. Uh, it's good for the time being until now, but going forward, it's it, as long as you have personal data with you, you are liable for uh, ensuring the compliance requirements are met. But overall, what you could do is make sure that all the internal procedures are in line with the requirement uh, under the regulation and the privacy policies. You review and update your employee, customer and supplier contracts Make sure that uh, secure personal um, data is uh, handled in a secure format and uh, it's, it's handled through appropriate organizational and technical measures. You make sure that the data is kept in a secure location and anybody who has access to it gets it on a need to know basis and verify if data transfers outside the EU are compliant with the GDPR requirements. So the idea is, um, since we are only as strong as a weakest link, make sure that uh, across the organization, every single individual is sensitized to the idea of handling data with integrity. And uh, you know, carelessness is not permitted. And if they're using devices, which they're taking home, and if they're accessing uh, data on their devices, make sure that adequate precautionary measures or protection measures are enabled on those devices as well. And that would go a long way in reducing chances of a breach. Okay, ma'am. So, uh, should we move forward with the presentation? Yes, please. Um, I'll quickly run through penalties and then move on to what we uh, uh, what we here in India are doing about the regulation. Uh, so, the penalties, of course, as we know, are two tiered. One is, uh, you know, we have 
penalty is uh, going up to as high as uh, 10 million euros and or 2% of the annual global turnover, whichever is higher. And secondly, up to as high as 20 million or 4% of the annual turnover of the previous year, depending on the severity of the violations. Now the severity, um, again, more severe violations relate to the basic principles of processing data. You know, your key principles of fairness, transparency, and things like that. And uh, they also largely relate to consent, obtaining consent. Google recently um, lost an appeal uh, against um, the French uh, government for, uh, uh, you know, I think a 50 million euro um, fine. Uh, and that revolved around uh, some very dicey uh, consent that was uh, obtained by Google. And that has uh, led to uh, fines, which of course um, the uh, EU is not very, uh, very lenient with. So we have to be very careful when we are dealing with consent. But of course, um, you also have data subject rights. Any violation in not addressing their requests also could lead to fines. And of course, data transport to international organizations or recipients. That's as far as the severity are concerned. In addition to that, largely the way they assess how a fine will be assessed and in what amounts depends on the nature and severity of the event itself, the data category, uh, whether the, the breach was intentional or negligent, and the mitigation itself. Have you taken any efforts to mitigate the damage? What precautionary measures have you taken? How have you cooperated with the authorities? Did you um, notify the concerned people within the mandated 72 hours? Uh, did you notify the data subject if it was sensitive personal data and things like that? And of course, if you've had previous history uh, with compliance uh, you know, issues or if there have been corrective actions uh, proceeded against you in the past, yes, that could really up the uh, stakes for you as far as penalties are concerned. But overall, this is what it is all about when it comes to penalties. But I would say the best thing with penalties is as long as you're sure with your compliance and you're doing a good job of it with due diligence, uh, regardless of when an incident happens or whether it happens or not, um, it's, it's all about uh, showing your diligence and integrity in handling the data. I think that would go a long way in ensuring that you're not penalized such hefty amounts. I think with that, we end GDPR. If anybody has any questions so far specifically with regard to GDPR, Soumya, please let me know. Otherwise, we can move on to the PDP bill. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, we just had a quick poll here, so if we could take that. Sure. Okay, that's good. 80% uh, 80, 80 of them are pretty, <laughs> they're very confident they're equipped. That is good. So uh, as for the others who are not confident, I hope what I've shared just now will help you to be uh, more particular about what, you've, uh, what you're missing. And uh, that should help you to ensure that your compliance is more in line with the requirement. Uh, okay, ma'am. There was just this one question about penalties that we could take up. So it was basically that what are the consequences for violation of GDPR regulations by an Indian entity? Okay. Take? Yeah. So yeah, I do see uh, quite a few questions wondering about what happens if an in Indian entity. Largely, when it comes to Indian entities, the simple question you got to say is, are you handling personal data as defined under the regulation in the course of your business? If you are, then yes, you're subject to the regulation and your penalties would be pretty much, not pretty much, they're exactly the same as they would be to anybody who's violating. So you're subject to the law, uh, the regulation of the GDPR and the penalties also as mentioned there. If you're not dealing with the uh, personal data of EU citizens as we just discussed throughout, then you're not subject to the GDPR and of course the penalties also don't apply to you. So what you got to see here is not whether you're an Indian entity, but whether you're processing data that could be considered personal data under the GDPR. 
So now, if we have no more questions, Samia, I'd like to move on to the PDP bill. Okay. We'll, yeah, we'll move on to this and whatever questions we have, we'll take it after. Sounds good. Thank you. So uh, now the PDP bill was introduced in 2019. That incidentally is actually the second bill. We had a bill in 2018, which was revised and then came out in 2019 as a, a PDP bill of 2019 and has already garnered a lot of interest and attention and debate for various reasons. Uh, it is what we call the, um, the GDPR equivalent or the GDPR counterpart in India, but it has its own um, a few distinctive features, which I'd like to quickly touch upon. Because we are short on time, I'll keep them very short and again, introduce these concepts to you so that you're again aware as to what it is. Now, this bill again is uh, pretty much like the GDPR applies to processing of personal data by companies incorporated in India. Foreign companies that are dealing with personal data of individuals in India. Now, this PDP is again, as you all know, relevant to us Indians. So any foreign entity dealing with our personal data, Facebook, for instance, LinkedIn, well, that's subject to the PDP bill when it becomes law. And thirdly, government entities. So these are the three main categories of entities that will be subject to this. A quick note on the terms. The data subject that we discussed in the GDPR is what we call the data principle here in the Indian law. Uh, and a data fiduciary is nothing but the data controller, that is the entity that is that decides the means and pro the the means and the um, nature of processing of the personal data. So the data processor, sorry, the data controller under the GDPR is what we call the data um, fiduciary. Then we have the data processor as uh, discussed in the GDPR. We have a new category of data fiduciary called the consent managers. These are persons that enable a data principle, that is the individual, to gain, withdraw, review, and manage their consent through an accessible platform. So these are a new category separate from the GDPR. Then of course, categories of personal data, it's again another topic of discussion. We have three categories as distinguished from the two in GDPR. Well, like in the GDPR, we have the personal data, um, which is again, relating to an individual name, date, place of birth, things like that. And then of course, sensitive personal data, which relates to health, their uh, biometric data, the criminal history and things like that. Again, very similar to the uh, sensitive special categories of data in the GDPR. And the third category called critical personal data. This includes certain categories of personal data, which the central government has retained the prerogative to notify as and when it identifies any specific set of data as critical personal data, and that data shall be processed only in India, which means I think that's something we need to wait and see how that pans out when this bill becomes a law, because the government has retained to itself the right to identify certain class of data. We don't know what the class of data is. We don't know what kind of data it would be, but my guess is it would largely depend on the circumstances and um, the, the government can practically uh, identify any data as critical data and that would be subject to a lot of restrictions. One of the major ones being that such data cannot be taken outside the Indian uh, borders. Now that's as far as data, personal data is concerned. Now we have uh, anonymous data. Quick note on anonymous data is well, under the GDPR, anonymized data in any form is outside the purview of the regulation, but in India, the bill also at the moment exempts anonymized data, but under circumstances, circumstances, processing of anonymized data falls within the ambit. So that's something we need to be extremely careful about because that could have massive ramifications. Now, the reason the government gives is in order to enable better services, all formulation of evidence-based policies, that's that's a phrase that's used in the bill itself. It says formulation of evidence-based policies by the central government. Anonymized data can be subject to the GDPR, uh, sorry, the, the PDP bill. Uh, that's uh, moving on to penalties. We find that uh, the bill um, proposes uh, fines as well as imprisonment. 
that's a slight variation from the GDPR. We have uh, any fines going as high as uh, you know five crores or two percent of the annual global turnover, and the second tier being fifteen crores or four percent of the annual turnover of the uh, entity. Again, if there is, let us say, um, what they call re-identification or processing of de-identified personal data, that is somebody has withdrawn their consent, but somebody continues to process the data, then in such a case, then that entity or individual uh, is punishable with imprisonment of up to three years or fine of up to two lakhs or both fine and imprisonment. And if there is processing of any time there is processing of something called uh, sensitive data or let's say critical data, then yes, there's definitely going to be imprisonment and fine. Then coming to the most important aspect of uh, processing consent. In India, unlike in the GDPR, if you're dealing with personal data of in the in individuals in India, consent is the main legal basis under which you have to process the data. Uh, and under the GDPR, you have the option to choose it, as, choose it as a last option, avoid it if you can, but in India, that has to be the first basis under which you are processing data. And that also means a lot for entities uh, that be extremely careful in how they're obtaining consent. And um, there are certain exceptions there where uh, personal data can be processed without consent, uh, provided it is required by the state in order to provide benefits or if such processing is mandated under law, or if there's a court order or judgment, you don't need consent of the entity. Or if there's a medical emergency, or you have to treat somebody, or there's, a, there's a, again, a pandemic, or uh, if you want to ensure public safety during any disaster or breakdown of public order. Uh, pretty extreme cases, but yes. Uh, you know, it's important to understand that consent for us is basically the first and the foremost basis of processing data. Uh, and largely, it is, I think, the only uh, basis. The others are not that uh, common for us. So assume for the purposes of uh, personal data that consent would be your go-to when you are processing Indian uh, individuals' information. Again, you have uh, data principles. Enjoy certain rights under the, data, the bill, pretty much like the GDPR. Another uh, Interesting development is something called social intermediaries. I'm thinking things like Facebook. These are entities or platforms that have a certain number of uh, members or users above a certain threshold. So these are entities that are providing platforms for people to use and share information. And they've been included because of recent developments in the past, in the past two, three, four years, where uh, they have had a lo lot of effect on society and the general populace because of their ability to sway public opinion and enable large scale sharing of information. We're talking WhatsApp, talking Facebook, where information that may not be correct or accurate is being transferred on a large scale basis. And all these intermediaries, which have users, like I said, above a certain notified threshold and whose actions can impact democracy or public safety or public order, um, they come within the purview of the bill and they are subject to certain mandatory compliances. What are those compliances? They could be things like conducting audits, maintenance of records, data protection, impact assessments. They probably have to be much more robust there and appointment of data protection officers and also be able to enable something called voluntary user verification mechanism for users in India such that you know, the verification is visible to all the users. Now you and I as users should be able to use that verification mechanism. So this is simply done to ensure accountability, prevent fake profiles and things like that. But that's again, a big obligation for social media platforms. Then comes, uh, yeah, we do have a DPA pretty much like anywhere else that would be called the DPA, the Data Protection Authority of India. And uh, transfer of data outside India also um, has a lot of uh, restrictions. Sensitive data may be transferred, uh, but it has, has to be explicitly consented to by the individual whose data is being transferred and also subject to certain other additional conditions. However, sensitive personal data, uh, you know, we're talking of critical data, cannot leave the shores of the country and must be processed only in India. Then the two things I'd like to add before I conclude of it comes when it comes to the PDP bill, 
there's something of a sandbox, the discussion of creation of a sandbox, which will encourage innovations and ideas in the areas of artificial intelligence, machine learning, or any emerging technology um, that is to encourage innovation without fear of public uh, retaliation or uh, any threat to public interest or any regulatory violations. So this is created specifically to ensure that there is a proper R&D and innovation without uh, negative repercussions. And this is open to entities whose privacy by design by default policies are pretty robust and they're certified by the DPA of India. If they have pretty good uh, privacy by design policies and they have the required certification from the Indian Data Protection Authority, these entities will be included in the sandbox and they will enjoy certain additional exemptions under the bill. So it's more like an incentive for entities to ensure they have pretty robust uh, privacy policies and uh, technical measures as well. The final thing is uh, the exemption. The exemptions under the bill, uh, the central government, of course, is the overall authority here. It is vested with the power to exempt any of its agencies, any central government agency from the provisions of the act. Not always, uh, not forever, but it can exempt certain data processors. It can exempt certain kinds of processing and it can exempt for certain reasons such as research, archiving, statistical purposes, manual processing, or uh, processing by small entities. And um, again, exemption for sandbox, which could encourage innovation. So these are some of the exemptions, but then the uh, final word uh, lays with the central government, and we need to see how that pans out as well. Uh, but all said and done, even with these exemptions, it is extremely clear that the basic objective of uh, this bill is a clear and lawful purpose. And once that is met, then the data must be protected with appropriate safeguards. And only then can they go ahead and think of you know, any of these exemptions or additional um, measures. So that's as far as uh, the PDP bill is concerned. But since it's at the bill stage at the moment, I'd be a little wary of uh, you know, basing my opinions heavily one way or the other, and I'd prefer to wait and see how this comes out in the form of the act, which hopefully it will be out soon. So um, just to quickly recap what we just discussed, we discussed the fundamentals of the GDPR as to what the GDPR is all about, why it has come into existence, the key principles, the key players, the core concepts, technical measures, um, and the organizational best practices when it comes to compliance, uh, what rights of the uh, data subjects are, uh, you know, and, and what they are and how they impact you as a processor as a, or a controller, uh, the penalties, what happens in case you don't uh, uh, follow the regulations or if there's an inadvertent breach, what happens? And of course, what you need to do when there's a breach that's as far as the GDPR is concerned. And of course, a quick overview of our own PDP bill. So to sum up, I would say um, it does sound pretty uh, exhaustive and uh, sometimes uh, very um, uh, exhausting as well. But uh, the best way to approach this would be to understand who you are. Are you a controller or your processor? And uh, what the extent of your processing of data is? Keep a good handle on your processing activities. And I think that should go a long way in ensuring that you are compliant. Uh, and just try to be compliant to the best of your ability. And I think you should be fine with it. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, could we take some questions right now regarding the PDP bill? Sure, go ahead. Okay, ma'am. So one that is there is that whether Aadhaar and KYC are included in the privacy data of the common man or whether they would be subject to GDPR. Yes, yes. Uh, not GDPR, uh, because like I said, uh, this relates to Indian individuals and uh, that would be subject only to the PDP bill, so not to the GDPR at all. But yes, they're definitely uh, personal data of individuals and they would be subject to the personal data protection bill. And this is data protection. Data protection only relates to protection of the data of the individual. That is personal identifying information. Privacy 
is a slightly larger concept and uh, it also includes everything that goes beyond your uh, name and other identifying factors. So that's a slight distinction I'd like to make. Uh, it, it is part of your personal data and yes, part of the larger privacy, but privacy is slightly a uh, wider concept than personal data protection alone. But to answer your question, yes, uh, they would be considered a personal data and no, they're not part of the GDPR. Okay. Uh, another question that was there was that does uh, GDPR distinguish between public sector and private sector? Like the PDB bill here, would that, you know, do that as Canadian privacy laws do? And like that in relation to GDPR and everything? Yes, uh, GDPR does not. But uh, under GDPR, as we noticed, you know, when it comes to DPO, if you are a government authority, you have to have a DPO. So there is no distinction as such between the GDPR, uh, sorry, the government authorities or private entities when processing data. But yes, uh, you you probably have to be a lot more particular and uh, follow the laws a lot more when you're a government authority, such as having a DPO in place. But when you're discussing it in relation with the Canadian laws, that's a clear distinction they have there. We don't have that kind of a distinction in the GDPR. Neither do we have it in India. But in India, as you can see, the government has certain rights or a prerogative which it can use to exempt certain entities or certain activities outside the bill. So that's as far as the right of the government is concerned, but I would not treat them specifically as separate uh, as the Canadian law does. So no, it's not that distinct. Okay, ma'am. Uh, we have short like over 20 minutes over the allotted time, <laughs> but if we could like do a few more questions and then we could wrap up. Sure. So one of the questions that came up right now, like if you're okay with it, that as you explained PDP and the personal data. So uh, the audience is very much interested that like due to the prevalence of social media, and even though there is this idea of end-to-end -end data encryption and all of that, mm -hmm. how do these tech giants stand in respect of now that the PDP bill is there and if that comes and becomes a law? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question again? Okay, so uh, the PDP bill in respect to the tech giants that are there, suppose Google, WhatsApp, Facebook, mm -hmm. in India. So like recently there was this case where the WhatsApp chats were leaked. So would the PDP bill create a difference in this aspect? Well, yeah, definitely. They would uh, have to answer the Indian government as well, the way they're doing with the GDPR. And uh, uh, from what I can sense, I think uh, Facebook also has been hit with, with a fine very recently. I think uh, in June 2019, sorry, 2020, they were facing a fine. Um, and they will have most likely face the same kind of uh, issue when it comes to Indian entities and uh, data of in Indian individuals. Uh, the bill also makes specific reference to what we just uh, discussed, called the social intermediaries. So these are what we call the social media platforms or any platform that uh, you know allows for people to come together, WhatsApp, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. So these are the entities that would be definitely subject to the PDP requirements. And yes, they just have to be a lot more careful how they're sharing information and how they're letting people share information with the larger uh, world. Um, another one, ma'am, uh, like how is GDPR applicable to European citizens living in other countries. So yeah, good question. Yeah. See, it's good because very often we, you know, when we think GDPR, we think Europe, Europeans. So it's that's not quite the way it is because when I first started the discussion, I mentioned something about how GDPR is applicable to a person living in Europe, regardless of the legal status. So you could be a European citizen, you could be a European resident, an Indian working in Europe, for instance or you could be uh, somebody just traveling through. You could be a traveler, you could be a student, or you could just be a patient going there for medical uh, you know, treatment. So as long as you're in, the Europe, in Europe physically, any information you share at that point of time is subject to the GDPR, regardless of your legal status. So what that means is if you're a European citizen, you're, you, let's say you're a German traveling in India, and you're sharing some information pertaining to you while you're in India, you're outside Europe, that information does not get protection under the GDPR. But the moment he goes back home and he shares some information with you while he is there, again, that information comes within the purview of the GDPR. 
the person has to be physically present in the European Union at the time of sharing the data for that data to be given the protection. Otherwise, you know, this gets completely messed up and there's no way you can draw a line as to where and how the applicability, you know, starts and ends. Okay, I'm just one last question we'll take. So that is about like if someone wants to make a career in GDPR, say as a CIPP, like the Certified Information uh, Privacy Professional, or what are the growth perspectives for a lawyer in GDPR? So if you could like quickly address that. Absolutely. See, uh, GDPR or privacy laws are at the moment, you know, talk of the town. Uh, and uh, the way things are moving, the way technology is improving, I think we see a lot of lot more uh, happening in this area. And as far as the career is concerned, yes, it, there's ample scope for growth in, in this area. Um, certifications, very much like degrees, are just an, uh, I would say, indication that, yeah, you do have some knowledge of this subject. You know, it's about the theoretical knowledge of what constitutes GDPR or what constitutes, you know, privacy. Uh, but in order to have uh, maybe a, a good scope for growth or a full-fledged career, I think it would be a great idea for you to start off with uh, trying to get some experience, start off uh, in an area where you will be working with these concepts day in and day out. And uh, since these are emerging areas, I think you are at the right time to, if you're really starting a career or building a career in this area, I think this is a great time to just start off working. But yes, you have to amply support this degree or certification with good work experience. And then yes, it's a great option. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am. So um, thank you, Kalpana, ma'am, for such an enriching session. And I'm sure all of us present here benefited immensely by your expertise. So as for our attendees, we have a quick last poll before we wrap up. And so if you're interested in a follow-up session, please record your responses here. And thank you so much again, everyone, for joining in. And have a great day. Just this quick poll. Thank you. It was launched here. Thank you, ma'am, for your time. And we had a very interesting session. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everybody. You can just have the poll. Thank you so much, Dion. Hopefully, we'll see you again. Thank you, uh, Samia. Thank you, everybody. Uh, have a good evening. Thank you. Ma